Yate Bene. Good morning, my relatives. It's Mark Charles. I'm sitting down for my second cup of coffee, and I invite you to join me today. I am thrilled. I'm going to be having a conversation with Lenore Three Stars. And I get to introduce her. Well, she's already been introduced as this, but she is a badass indigenous grandma and is working to decolonize, uh, has done a lot of work and had kind of this, can't even call it a career, but this work kind of drop on her that she just has picked up and is doing in a very, very good way. And I'm thrilled that she agreed to take some time to talk with me over a cup of coffee this morning. And I hope you will enjoy uh, enjoy the conversation we're going to have. Unfortunately, she won't have time to join us for a Q&A on Patreon later. But uh, I'm expecting this conversation will go very well. And hopefully it will just be one of many conversations we may have moving into the future. But uh, for those of you who, who don't know me, my name is Mark Charles. I am a dual citizen of the United States and the Navajo Nation. I ran as an independent candidate for president back in 2020 with a vision to build a nation where we the people actually means all the people. And I am working. I'm using my podcast. I'm using my platform. I'm using the books I've written, the things I'm doing to create a common memory. Not to cancel people, not to put down people, but to talk about our history so we can build a better community moving forward. And in my Navajo culture, we would call it walking in beauty. And I invite you to join me. I'm glad you're here. And I look forward to the conversation we're going to have with Lenore Three Stars, a badass indigenous grandma who is also working to walk in beauty. Thanks for joining my relatives. I want to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from what are the lands of the Piscataway. These lands um, uh, are now called Washington, D.C. My Navajo people call them Washington. Um, but uh, it's the Piscataway who were here long before Columbus got lost at sea. And I want to acknowledge the Piscataway as the host of the lands where I'm living. I want to thank them for their stewardship of these lands. And I just want to state how humbled I am to be walking and living on these lands today. I'm actually leaving tomorrow for some travel, and I'm going to be traveling to Phoenix tomorrow morning. And this week, uh, it's been going on for about a week and a half already, but this weekend, I'm going to be at the last three days of the Phoenix Film Festival. And uh, I was filmed in a documentary called Bad Indian, Hiding Out in Antelope Canyon. And it's a, it's a, the story about a Navajo family and their ancestors in uh the northern Arizona, southern Utah area of our reservation, where one of their ancestors actually hood, hid out in the canyons during the long walk. And they asked me to share some of my perspective, not only on the long walk, but also on Manifest Destiny and Abraham Lincoln's genocidal policies towards, towards Native peoples. And I'm thrilled that this, this documentary is going to be coming out at the Phoenix Film Festival. The premiere is going to be Friday afternoon tomorrow. Um, it will also be showing on Saturday, and it's showing on Sunday, and it's sold out most of those showings, and so they added a fourth time, a fourth showing on Saturday morning. So there's one Saturday morning and our Sunday morning and one Sunday afternoon that I heard they just opened up this week because there was so much interest in this film. So I'm really excited about that. If you're in the Phoenix area and want to try and get into uh, those showings that are on Sunday, I believe last I heard about a day and a half ago, there were still some seats available in those at the Phoenix Film Festival. Um, the other thing then is I'm going to be actually with my family up in New Mexico for about a week, about five days. My father is having hip surgery. And I'm going to be with him, uh, helping him and my mom as uh, he recovers from that surgery. And so I'll be in New Mexico for a, back on our reservation for about a week. And then next weekend on, uh, on April 20th, I'm flying to Portland, Oregon. And um, for those of you who don't know, I, if, if you read the book on Selling Truths, if you've read the book I wrote, you'll know that the hardest two chapters to read in that book are chapters 9 and 10 which deal with the mythology and the mythological legacy of Abraham Lincoln. And it demonstrates that not only was he a blatant, unapologetic, self-proclaimed white supremacist until the day he died, but he was also one of the most genocidal presidents in U.S. history towards Native peoples. At the end of those two chapters, I can directly compare him to Hitler, and nobody bats an eye. And... What I've been doing for this past few months is I've been developing a presentation. I, I've just been calling it a Lincoln event, a Lincoln presentation. 
And my goal is, is to try to engage the nation, not only with who Abraham Lincoln was and what he did, but what does it say about us that this is the man we hold up as one of our greatest leaders? This is the best example of what it means to be an American, a self-proclaimed, unapologetic, blatant white supremacist who is also horrifically genocidal towards Native peoples. And this is someone we call our hero. So I, I've already been presenting. I present on Lincoln regularly, but I'm, I'm trying to put it into a 75-minute presentation now. And it's going to talk about, obviously, what Lincoln did, but I'm also going to share how my own mythology of Lincoln began to break down and how I began to learn some of these things. I'm going to tell some of my personal story as well as some of my people's story, the Navajo people, especially with our long walk and our experience with Lincoln. And... I'm going to weave a comedic thread through it. I'm, I'm working on that. But one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing these events, so I'm doing these Lincoln events, and I'm starting, my first one is going to be in Portland, Oregon on Saturday the 20th. Now, unfortunately, these are invitation-only events. Um, and so people who are, are subscribed to my Patreon or other people who I will intentionally invite will come to these first events that I'm going to do over the next five or six months. And the reason I'm doing the events is to kind of hone the presentation. I really want to get it tight and I want to make it sharp and I want to make sure I'm hitting all the points I'm able to hit. And then towards the end of this year or early next year, I'm going to begin taking this presentation much more publicly. But so if you're interested in, 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 in being a part of this, um, again, whoever is subscribed to my Patreon, um, they will automatically receive an invitation to any event that happens in their area. But uh, uh, and other than that, I'm, these aren't going to be public presentations until um, after I kind of get the presentation a bit more home. But I'm thrilled that I'm finally giving my first uh, kind of uh, closed presentation in Portland this coming Saturday, I know, Saturday on, not this Saturday, but Saturday, April 20th. And then on Sunday, April 21st, I'll be doing two public events in Portland. I will be preaching at a church. Um, Sunday morning in Portland, Oregon. And then Sunday afternoon, I'm going to be giving kind of a preview presentation publicly on the, the book and the content from my book, Decolonizing Faith. And the time and date of that presentation is still to be determined, but I will be preaching at the Groves Church at 3520 Southeast Yam Hill Street in Portland, Oregon. I don't have the time of that service. All this is coming together kind of very last minute. But I will be there on Sunday, April 21st, and then I'll be doing a presentation somewhere in Portland that afternoon, Sunday the 21st. Um, so if you're in the Portland area and you want to join these events, uh, follow my social media. I will begin laying out the details as soon as we get things confirmed and we have the dates and the time set. But uh, yeah, so that's what's coming up. I'm really looking forward to those presentations and to spending some time both in Phoenix, New Mexico, and in Portland. And uh, if you're in those areas, please feel free to reach out. I'd love to try and get together um, while I'm in those areas. So anyway, without further ado, I am now thrilled to introduce you to, which I would have never come up with this term on my own, but a badass indigenous grandma by the name of Lenore Three Stars. She is um, o Ogala Lakota, and she has been on a journey of decolonizing, and she is doing some tremendous work, and I'm excited that we can talk about her. So let's uh, please uh, join me in welcoming and inviting Lenore onto our presentation here, and thank you, Lenore, for joining. It's great to have you here. Well, sure. Thank you for inviting me. So I, I have to ask, right? We have to start off. Well, let me, let me give you a moment first, right? Um, please allow me to give you space to introduce yourself, however you would like to introduce yourself as a Native woman. Oh, thank you. My name is Lenore Three Stars, and I am Oglala Lakota, which is one of the seven bands of the Lakota that make up the Teton division of the Ocheti Shikomi which is the seven council fires, or maybe you learned it in school as the Great Sioux Nation. Um, I do uh, like to take time to introduce myself in terms of kinship because the Teoshbaye, the family system, is foundational in Lakota culture, as in you know all, all the indigenous cultures that I've ever heard of. Um, 
my dad is uh, Oglala Lakota from Pine Ridge, where I was born, where my grandparents were born on his side. And my mom is Minikoju Lakota, another one of the seven bands from um, Cheyenne River Agency. So our ancestral lands then are the Black Hills, includes the Black Hills. That's uh, where our creation story lives. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you, Lenore, and, and I'm thrilled to have you here. Uh, let's just start with how did you get from the Black Hills area to uh, the Pacific Northwest, where I know you live now? What yeah. what brought you across the country to that area of, of, of uh, Turtle Island? Oh, it's um, boss Indians around. <laughs> the B My dad worked for the BIA, so <laughs> he started out as a teacher, um, so we lived, you know, where there were Indian schools and Potato Creek, you know, on the Pine Ridge Reservation and different places. And then we ended up in Utah, Intermountain. And then, you know, in those days, men had career tracks. And so he would just put in for the next promotion and they go wherever that promotion was. And we ended up even in Juneau, Alaska. So I lived though quite a few years in Juneau, Alaska until I went to college in Colorado. And then, um, after college, I went and lived with my dad for um, a while, for that first year until I got my government job. And yeah. and he lived in Everett, Washington. By then, he was um, uh, superintendent of Western Washington Agency in uh, Everett. So that's how I raised my son in Lake Stevens, Washington. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you consider yourself a long-term resident of the Washington, the Pacific Northwest now, or do you hope to go back to Lakota land someday? Or what, what, what's your... Well, you never go back, right? I mean, you go back all the time. I, we do the same thing. Yeah, we were raised, you know, to those long, long summer car rides to go back. Um, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's no disconnection. I go back, you know, for my auntie, my dad's sister, she uh, last year I went back for her hundredth birthday party. Oh know? wow! Yeah, and she still wanted to go to the powwow. It just takes longer to get in the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I was trying to think when we first met. I feel like we've been in similar circles for a long time. Um, I I know it was when you spoke at CCDA a few years ago that I first had some longer conversations with you. But I know we we knew each other prior to that. Um, but, uh, I, I felt like I've kind of observed you a bit from afar. Mm -hmm. And then over these past couple of years, I've gotten to know you a little bit better as our paths have intersected a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, when I heard that you were a badass indigenous grandma, <laughs> <laughs> I had to smile because, right, Navajo culture is matrilineal. Um, it's, it's the grandmothers who own the sheep. And so, right, I still have some very vivid images when we lived on the reservation of seeing some of the old grandmas who are are old and elderly and, and no, don't move very fast, but they're the ones who, like, cuts the sheep's neck. They're the one who holds the sheep down and when we start the butchering. They don't do all the butchering, but it's their sheep. Uh, and right, so I have this image of these badass indigenous yes. with these big old butcher knives in their hands. Right, I mean, I have that image in my mind. And so it, it, when I hear that there's a group of indigenous women who are calling themselves badass indigenous grandmas, um, you know, I, as a novel person, the first thing I think of is one of these old our our, our grandmas on our reservation with their big old butcher knives. But. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm very curious to how how what is the work you're doing as a badass indigenous grandma, and how did that work come about? How did that group come together that you're working with um, to lead these cohorts? I know it's a cohort around the topic of decolonizing, mm -hmm. and there's you and a few other uh, indigenous grandmas who are who are leading this. But I, I'm just curious what, how this came together, what is the vision of it, and what's it like being known as a badass Indigenous grandma? <laughs> well, it was kind of a surprise to me, too. Um, <laughs> in, my, in our case, it's metaphorical <laughs> after listening to you. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was the pandemic. The pandemic birthed it, really, because... Um, 
don't know if you know, Erna Hackett. She's the one that has liberated. Mm -hmm. uh, liberated. I know her well, yes. Yeah. So she's the one that came to Edith and, and me and said, you know, that she thinks this would be a good idea because um, we're all on the board of Elohe, uh, with the uh, Indigenous Center for Earth Justice that the Woodleys run down in Yamhill, Oregon. And yeah. so we were talking about, and at the time, Zooms were pretty popular. And so Erna said, you know, we could if, do some decolonizing, indigenizing work around Elahe uh, to raise some funds because Elahe was just getting off the ground this last, this last uh, uh, formation of Elahe. And so we, Edith and I were like, who's going to want to hear us? <laughs> we, we didn't understand her. We didn't get, catch her vision right away. Um, and she's, oh yeah. And then we're going to charge money. And I go, what? You're going to charge? Who's going to pay money to hear us? So, so we were we were not early adopters, but yeah, uh, yeah. But she she was right, you know, and and she said, okay, now what are we going to call it? Well, I had just had a birthday, and so I got a birthday card from someone who called me a badass indigenous grandma. <laughs> so, so I told her that, and she said, that's perfect. So, so, <laughs> so Edith and I are like, oh my goodness. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it really has been a life giving um, for us, a life giving effort, uh, something that we didn't know that we had to offer. Um, the more that uh, we talked with the women who came, like in the early Zoom days, it, you know, we met all these um, highly educated, usually. Uh, yeah. women, professional women who had that kind of money uh, that they didn't mind paying, which surprised me and Edith. And um, then you get to know them and a large, a lot of the time the thread was that I have indigenous heritage, but I don't feel connected to it. You know, yeah. so it's like some identity issues. And, and I think in this country, every native has to go through that unless, you know, you were maybe on your reservation, there are people who never had to, to go through the colonization um, as deeply as like people who had to um, round it up in confederations where they didn't even get to be on their own indigenous land. Yeah. You know, they had to share with uh, other, other tribes and maybe they weren't always, you know, um, friendly, yeah. friendly tribes to each other. So, um, so we understood, I mean, Edith comes from the Shoshone uh, Wind River and, and, um, and I'm from Pine Ridge Reservation, which if you visited it, you know that there is some, uh, colonial deficits going on there, yeah. but, um, who's, who's going to understand the, the beauty too, the, the resilience that you came from. Yeah. So. No matter where I live, I always feel like I know who I am. You know, I have a creation story. I know um, who my people are. And I can go back and visit and and feel at home, you know. And, th and that's the fun part about going back to the rest is that when you're standing in line and nobody's paying attention to you, you never once think it's because I'm brown. <laughs> you just blend in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I... One of the things I, I love about what you just said, Lenore, is you were at first a bit hesitant to go <laughs> into this because you're like, who's going to want to hear from us, right? Who's going to want to 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 pay money to, to hear our perspective on things? Yeah. And when I was when I was back on a reservation and I was preaching and I was I was talking with our, our people, our elders, especially as the longer I, as I live there. I was astounded at the wisdom and I, I was I was blessed by the wisdom of our community mm. and the very real and practical faith and the spiritual truths they understood and perspectives on life and all of these things. And I thought, you know, if if the rest of the nation had any clue mm. what was really important in life, they would be lining up to hear from our elders, right? They would be lining up literally 
And yet, so often, our elders are not given platform. They're not given space. And because it, and it's not because they don't have something valuable to say. It's because society, in its colonial worldview, doesn't value what they have to offer. Mm -hmm. And so I am so, I mean, that's even one of my visions is, is when I hear your story, even of, yeah, not only of, of learning and gaining the experience of not only do I have something to offer, but it's valuable and people not only want to hear, it, but they need to hear it. Mm -hmm. And that really blesses me, Lenore. I am so grateful to hear that. And I would love to see more badass indigenous grandmas <laughs> well, begin, <they're> <laughs> begin to step into this, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And and so I'm I'm grateful that Erna kind of proposed mm -hmm. this to you. I'm grateful that that you and uh, um, Edith uh, jumped on board with that. And I'm thrilled that now this wisdom that you have has a platform to be shared. Mm. And it is being given the, the value and the credit that it deserves. Mm. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of surprising. This, this year was um, kind of a twist up to now it's been for women of color. Um, but this year we opened it up and said, you know, that um, white women would be welcome and it's, it's different it's a little different but um it's still i think what surprised me was that even white people want to decolonize you know i always get thought of it as a an indian thing but it's not you know yeah. if you've been involved in in religion you know you've probably reached a point where you think I'm not quite sure that's quite right. <laughs> you know, so yeah. there, there are some, a lot of questions of just decolonizing from organized religion. Yeah. And when you're thinking about <clears throat> land relationship, there's, there's a lot, a lot of room there too. Yeah. Can you give us, I we don't want you to give everything away, but what are some of the themes that you take people through in these cohorts? Like, how is it that you're working to try and decolonize? And what are some of the high points that you really try to hit to try and change their paradigm on? Well, there's four of us and we all have like our own, um, our own niche kind of. Mm -hmm. I talk about, uh, well, we all give our story, you know, our personal story. And then I talk about um, an indigenous worldview and how that relates to a theology of the land. And then um, there's another, we do six, six weeks. And then one week I'll, I'll do a presentation, an introduction to the doctrine of discovery. Um, I did um, a lot of work on that for our denomination uh, so yeah. that we could vote to repudiate. And, and then there's another grandma, my friend, uh, Robbie, Dr. Robbie Paul, and she, she has um, a doctorate in that involves her family story from the boarding schools, each generation down and how that affected her, you know, um, and how she found uh, healing, a way to start healing. You know, and none of this work is completely done ever, but she found a way to start healing and she shares that. Um, Edith's story of how Elahe came to be. I mean, you, you hear my prose about um, having a land relationship and what that means to know where you're from. And then Edith, talks about her personal story where this is the nitty gritty of what it looks like to actually live that out. You know, yeah. it's, none of it's easy. It's all hard work. So decolonization, when I first started, I realized that, why did I think this was going to be easy? It's not, it's not, but that's okay because you're finding liberation. You're finding freedom to just be who you are, to be yeah. who you were created to be. Um, Fern Cloud, she talks about, well, she's a, artist and she has done a lot of years in in ministry and we've all had you know um formation christian formation and we're all finding our way to um, be the person that that jesus sees not that the church sees and then there's yeah. so there's we all have different things to talk about throughout the week and then tonight is actually our last night 
And so the women have been processing and reading and doing a lot of self-education. I mean, that's a huge commitment. Ernest makes you go through an application process. So we get women who really, you know, want to be there and they're willing to, to work, put themselves into it. And so tonight we're going to be addressing the questions that they processed up to now. And it should really be interesting tonight. I just put your website up into the chat and I'll put it into the show notes of this episode as well. Um, people can find you at Lenore3stars.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm assuming this web, I, well, this website does give links to who you are and all the, a lot of the work that you're doing. So if you want to learn more about Lenore and what she's doing, I welcome you to, to visit her on this website and learn more about the, the work that she's doing. Um, as you know, Lenore, I'm, I'm writing a book right now called Decolonizing Faith. Mm -hmm. And I cannot agree with you more about not only, and I think what, what surprised me the most as I've begun to talk about the ways we need to decolonize our faith, mm -hmm. some of the strongest positive reaction I've received has come from women, mm -hmm. not just women of color, but also white women. Because when you look at the way that faith has been used to subjugate people, oh, yeah. the Christian faith has been used for thousands of years mm -hmm. to subjugate women. And so to begin to challenge that and to bring some of that to the forefront, it, 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 I, I would not be surprised if, if your audience just continues to grow in the work that you're doing, because there are a lot I'm finding as I talk about the content of the book and the things that I'm trying to point out, that there are a lot of women out there, even white women, who are like, yeah, we have been told these lies about our faith about our scriptures, about our role. And we have not been empowered and we've actually been oppressed in a lot of ways. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to see that you are um, engaging that conversation. What's your hope? Where would you like to be in five years? I know we talked earlier about this before we got on the show that you, this, I can't even call it a new career path, but the work you're doing, right? This work of being a badass indigenous grandma, writing, speaking, sharing about your process of decolonizing, right? This is just kind of happened. You don't run an organization. You don't have a title. You don't work for somebody. You're just doing these things. Where now, but now that you're in it, right, you're doing it where would you like to be in five or five or 10 years? Like what, what would you like to see happen with what you're doing? Well, and you know, where it's going. Well, I'm, I'm constantly reminded that all these conversations, all these ideologies, all these things, you know, they are going to pale in comparison to the climate disaster that is just hanging over our heads. So I think, before I, I imagine too much, I would like to imagine that we know how to take care of the earth. I would like to imagine that we could live in a way that we could um, yeah. have a planet that we could live on. Uh, and that's, I think, is why I I support so much Ayla Hay and the other organization that, that I'm in circle with that puts creation care at the center of who you are. Yeah. Because it's not an add-on if you actually want to live on this planet. Um, so I hope that our work in decolonizing will bring us into a relationship with the land, with the planet that we live on, with seeing uh, Unchimaka, Grandmother Earth, as a relative that you would, um, that you live with, not tromp on or extract from. So all these things are important um, in decolonizing, I think it's going to be imposed on us. You know, it's going to every could be that everybody's going to get the reservation experience because we are not taking care of um, of our earth. We're yeah. so out of relationship with our earth, and I I think I can 
when Chimacaw cries out that, you know, and all the fires and the floods and, and the this climate disasters and earthquakes. I mean, I feel that when Chimacaw is lamenting that loss of relationship that we once had when we all thought we were part of creation instead of, you know, the pinnacle, the masterpiece that could um, extract it all. Yeah. Well, Lenore, thank you so much for taking some time to share a cup of coffee with me this morning. <laughs> I am I am grateful for your work. I am grateful for your wisdom and for the conversations that you are working to initiate in the circles that you're in. Um, it's an honor to know you. I have great respect for the for the Oglala Lakota people. I'm especially grateful for the attitude your people have regarding the Black Hills mm -hmm. and that you're not letting the U.S. government pay you for them. Right. Um, right. And you are telling them, no, you, you can't just buy them from us. You can't sell a relative. You, you can't. And I have I tell that to a lot of people mm -hmm. and I use that as a perspective of, yeah, this is this is how we have to change our understanding of our relationship to the world we live in. And so I, I'm grateful for you and for your people and for the way that you are stewarding your lands. Mm. Um, and it's been an honor to share a cup of coffee with you this morning. Uh, I, I shared your website earlier for anyone else who wants to uh, find Lenore. Uh, look her up on her website at Lenore3stars.com. Mm. Uh, you can also Google Lenore Three Stars uh, Badass Indigenous Grandma and you'll get <laughs> some websites uh, where that work is going on too. I Googled that just to make sure um, nothing inappropriate came up. But yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it friend, was. Um, there, big ass Indigenous Big ass. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so anyway, so thank Lenore for joining. And for people who want to follow the work I'm doing a little bit more, I'm going to give you a link to my Patreon. And again, if you're especially if you're interested in getting in on some of these Lincoln events that I'm, I'm kind of testing right now, uh, if you subscribe to me on Patreon, uh, you will receive an invitation to attend these events. Um, as they happen around the country. So uh, right now I'm, I'm opening them up. Are, they're not public events. They're closed events for select audience, mainly so I can kind of test the content and engage a bit deeper with people about it before I begin taking it more publicly. But uh, for anyone who subscribes to my Patreon, they will receive invitations to attend these events in the different areas that are going to be around the country. Um, so anyway, my relatives, thank you for joining me today. Lenore, thanks for joining me in this journey of learning how to walk in beauty and of calling our nation to learn how to walk in beauty together. So thank you and we'll see you again later. Okay.